I'm Dr. Juliet Madrigal Dirge. Um, I have a um, cash only practice in Marble Falls, Texas, about 40 miles outside of Austin. I have never taken insurance and I opted out of Medicare, I think, six years ago. Where I practice, I practice the way I want to. I give a discount to teachers and preachers. I give a discount to people wearing spurs, because that's how we do it in Texas. <laughs> and people who have cancer, we see completely for free. If they're a patient of ours and they get cancer, we don't charge them at all. And we can do that because I don't take insurance and I'm not regulated by any of the government entities. But the most important part of that is that I love going to work every day. Every single day is rewarding and every day I give something back and I give a lot. And that's what I think is so important about medicine. And that's where the AAPS really shines. What the AAPS does is support doctors and patients. And Jane would be here to correct me right now and say patients and doctors because the patient comes first. The other day, when I was going through some of our pamphlets and brochures, I saw our motto, Omnia Pro Agroto. And I thought about that, and all for the patient. And I'm not sure I had ever really seen that before because a lot of what we talk about is freedom and escaping our bounds that other entities try to put on us. So I thought, are we really doing that? Is our organization all for the patient? You know, it really is. What we're doing up here and what we're trying to fight is anything that is against the patient. So this year, we've made a lot of accomplishments. We've, we are continuing to fight Obamacare because that's not good for the patients. And we're continuing to fight for freedom of physicians in the MOC and MOL, maintenance of certification and maintenance of licensure. When you go and take a test and study for months on end to be recertified by an entity that basically just wants your money. All that does is take time away from patients. When I took my test this year, I learned very little that had to do with taking care of patients. And I can tell you I learned nothing new, except I learned that they have these new palm readers that can see the veins in your hand. I learned what it's like when people get incarcerated and have to remove all their clothing and be scanned and be watched for the eight hours that I took the test. I learned that if I put my broken foot up and elevated it while I took the test, that my test would be invalidated and I would fail. I didn't learn anything that helped. I didn't learn anything that helped the patient and it took valuable time away from the patient and away from things that would make me a better doctor. And I am so glad that AAPS is fighting that because it's not helping the patient. It's not all for the patient. And when we get these new ICD-9 codes or 10 codes or 11 codes that just have more and more data and make us reduce patients to more and more numbers, that is not all for the patient. How much time is that going to take you away from your patient care to decide if the patient was my favorite favorite example, if they were bit by a macaw versus a parrot. And this is supposedly safety information that goes somewhere, really, because the government's going to come out with a study about how people should buy parrots instead of macaws? I don't think so. And I don't think that data is going anywhere that's helping the patients. And I'm not going to do it. And the APS is going to help you not to do it. So I would tell you, don't do it. Struggle. <laughs> Struggle and fight. This is a fight worth fighting because it is for our future and it is for the patients. The other day I was um, writing a prescription for one of my patients who was dying of cancer. She has no family, she's young, she had an incurable cancer, really isn't even treatable. All she wanted to do with her last few days on earth is figure out where her state was going to go. So she was traveling to various hospitals, children's facilities, some wacky places, and some that you would expect. But she was really tired, really, really tired. So in an effort to try to help her, I gave her some Adderall. Worked great. Her insurance company wanted me to fill out a form explaining how she had ADD. 
There's nowhere on the form for me to write, this patient doesn't have ADD. This patient is dying of cancer. Please give her this medication. So her medication wasn't covered. So that's that much more money that didn't go to her estate. So I filled out forms and forms and faxed them and faxed back. And my staff was on call, you know, on hold for 10, 20, 30 minutes off and on. And I finally did get that approved two days after she died. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be part of that system. And you shouldn't either. That's not for patients. That's for someone else to make money. And I know that none of us have time. I know we have very little extra time. And I know that we want to spend all that time with the patients. But if you can carve out just a little amount, and I know you don't want to talk to politicians, because neither do I. But if you can and you will, you will make a big difference. Because Washington doesn't think you exist. They think you're in the AMA. They think you subscribe to all that. I'm not gonna use a bad word. All that stuff. <laughs> so you need to make sure they know that you don't and that what you stand for is the patient-doctor relationship and taking care of patients. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a story about my life because I'm the president for one more day and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and I think all doctors like good medical stories. And I think, I don't think anybody knows this story actually. Okay, and it has a point, I promise. When I was in labor with my second child, I decided that I wanted to VBAC. So that's for people who have had cesarean sections and want to have a vaginal birth. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to have a lot of kids, a lot of kids, which my husband would always say, I hope your next husband likes a lot of kids. <laughs> but I really did. I wanted to have like 10 kids. So I decided to try this thinking that this would be a better way to be able to have more children. So when I went into labor, um, I decided I was going to do everything natural. So when I first went into labor, I was actually still on call for a pediatric psych unit. So I was doing that little breathing thing that's really easy when you're not really in labor, but you think you are. So I'm on call and doing, whoosh, 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 sh, 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 sh. yeah, give them Tylenol, that's cool. Whoosh, whoosh. And I'm thinking, I am a hero. I am one bad doctor. Or as Mac would say, one bad chick. So, well then about 10 hours into that, I decided that natural childbirth was invented by a man, <laughs> it was an absolute scam, and then I was going to have no more part of that. So they called for the anesthesiologist. He came in, and he gave me a glorious, wonderful, beautiful epidural. Now, I don't know if this guy was tall, short, fat, or skinny, but I loved this guy. And I told him multiple times. So the next few hours were beautiful. It was perfect. The nurses would come in, and they would look at my contraction strip and the baby's heart rate, and they would say, wow, that was a big one. And I would smile because I was clearly very good at this. Well, then about a few hours later, something happened. And I began to feel this weird tearing sensation in my left lower quadrant. And I started to get this bad feeling, this really bad feeling. So the next time the nurse came in, she looked at the strip and she frowned, and she got this weird look on her face. And I turned to my husband and I said, you know what, if I didn't know better, I would think that my uterus was rupturing. So then the doctor came in and she looked at the strip, and she frowned, and I told her about this weird burning, tearing feeling I was having. Well, the next thing I know, I'm going 50 miles an hour down the hall to the surgical suite. So they prepped me for an emergency C-section. Only the problem was that glorious, wonderful epidural I had, well, it wasn't working anymore. And I could feel everything. So I could feel them as they cleaned my belly, and I could feel them as they started to put the cold scalp on. So my anesthesiologist, best friend, tried to give me another epidural. Well, that didn't work. So then he said, well, I'm going to do something we hardly ever do anymore, and I'm going to give you an old-fashioned saddle block. So when he gave me that, it seemed like it worked for a few minutes, and then I couldn't swallow. And then I started to not be able to breathe. So then I turned to my husband and I said, I'm gonna have a seizure and then I'm gonna die. And that's what I did. 
So while I was busy seizing and aspirating and having my ureter nicked and having my uterus fall apart like wet tissue paper, the doctors were intubating and doing CPR and trying to get a sick baby out of a seizing, convulsing mom. But I wasn't there. I was somewhere far away, really far away. And what I saw and what I felt was total peace. And I felt like I was underwater. It was dark blue and peaceful and everything felt good. And I could see a bright, bright light. And it looked like, you know when you're underwater and you can see the sun? That's what it looked like. And I was floating up towards the sun. And it was fine. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave my husband. I didn't want to leave my son. And I was pretty sure my baby was coming with me. But the reason I'm telling you this today is because when that happened, I had an overwhelming feeling that what I was supposed to have done here was be a doctor. I knew that I was supposed to be a doctor, and that's what God wanted me to do, and I had done that. So all the rest of this, this is dessert. This is all bonus. So every day that I'm here, I remember why I'm here. I'm here to be a doctor. I'm here to take care of the patient. I didn't, I didn't die and come back for an insurance company or for Obamacare or for ICD-10 codes. I'm here to take care of the patient. And I know that all of you are too. And I just want you all to remember God told me himself what we're supposed to be doing. And I feel really strongly about it. And I know you do too, because nobody goes into this without a calling. You've got to have it in your heart. So remember this, and remember every day, it's the patient. It's being the doctor taking care of the patient. Thank you. <laughs>